Well, it is good to be back. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not like I didn't enjoy being in the warm weather for eight, for seven days. That was actually really nice. We enjoyed being away because it was a chance for us to be together as a family, as well as a chance for our bones to get warmed up uh, after what is obviously going to be a cold Michigan winter. But it is always nice to come back and to be among the people of St. John's. I know that Father John did a nice job last week at beginning off this epiphany season by talking to you about the finding of Jesus in the temple. That is the beginning of the Epiphany lesson. And I know also that he made a reference to the Feast of the Epiphany. See, yes, I listened online to the sermon. I know also he made a reference to the Feast of the Epiphany itself. But you are actually here today for the only green Sunday of this year's Epiphany season. The first Sunday of Epiphany, the color is always white for the vestment. And then usually we have three, four, or five weeks of green vestment and we talk about this season of Epiphany. Well, next week we have a special feast day, the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul. And then the week after that, we start our pre-Lenten just on Sundays, and we get right into the purple. So this is your one chance. So if you're a big green vestment fan, you got to soak it all up today. And then you'll get, to have, you'll get a whole full of it June through November. But we need to remember that this season, and unfortunately it's a short one for us this time, this season is about our ability to understand that God has made manifest in His Son, Jesus Christ, that He is in fact God and man. The Feast of the Epiphany, which was on, June, on January 6th, is actually called the Feast of the Manifestation of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. On the Christmas celebration, we heard about these shepherds who heard announced to them that Jesus was born, and they went and they worshipped. The shepherds representing the people of Israel, the people of the original covenant with God. But the Magi are not Jews. They are Gentiles. They are from foreign lands and foreign religions. And yet even they, by the announcing of the star, realized that something great, something holy, and what they probably couldn't even begin to comprehend, something divine has happened in the birth of Jesus. And so they too come and they worship the newborn king. So both the Jews and the Gentiles, the manifestation that God has sent his own son is revealed to both. Last week we're beginning to hear the story that Jesus is comprehending and that he knows in his fullness as the son of God that his mission is to be about his father's business. Every time I hear those lessons that Jesus has left behind in the temple, I think of Macaulay Culkin in the Home Alone. The, ah! They leave Jesus behind. And yet Jesus is not stunned or surprised. He's about his father's business. Listening to the instruction in the temple and giving instruction even as a boy of 12. So again, we begin to see being made manifest in Jesus that in fact he knows about God because he is God. But remember both the word manifest and epiphany means a revelation, an understanding. We talk about having an epiphanal moment where the light bulb goes off and we say, aha! Or the word manifest means to have something shown to you about the truth. Well, I always think that today's lesson about the baptism of Jesus is one of those really great epiphanal moments. Yes, the story of his baptism is interesting. After all, Jesus doesn't need to be baptized. He is without sin. John the Baptist, who has been sent ahead to prepare for the coming of the public ministry of Jesus, is preaching a good news story of repentance. Come back to a relationship from God, with God. Repent of your sinfulness and be prepared for the promise that God has made to send a Savior. Well, the Savior is right there in front of John the Baptist. And the Savior does not need that ritual cleansing of a baptism. The people of the Jews 
have a ritual cleansing ceremony before worshiping. They wash. Even the Muslims in their worship will wash the floor as a symbol and a sign. The washing of feet before worship is reminded to us when we have our Monday Thursday celebration and I wash the feet of the congregation. This idea of being made clean, to being made pure, is unnecessary for Jesus. The choice of lessons in our lectionary for today is St. Mark, the simplest of the Gospels. But in John's Gospel, we hear a little dialogue that happens between John and Jesus, where John actually says to Jesus, you're the one who should be baptizing me. And he's absolutely right. And yet Jesus says, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. We must do this as that first public act of his ministry. But the baptism, even though he didn't need it, wasn't the epiphany. That wasn't the manifestation. The fact that John the Baptist knew that there was one coming whose shoe latches he was unworthy to unloose was not the epiphany, was not the manifestation. No, brothers and sisters, the aha moment is what happens when Jesus comes up and out of the water. Because in that moment, we hear and see all three persons of the Holy Trinity at work in the Godhead and in their person. Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is there in being baptized. God the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Holy Trinity, appears as the form of a dove and lights upon him. And God the Father himself speaks in the words of the psalmist, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What better way, what better manifestation, what more amazing epiphanal message can you have than all three persons of the Godhead being made manifest in the beginning of the baptism and the public ministry of Jesus. Now we're going to miss the rest of these epiphanal moments. We're going to miss Jesus turning water into wine, which seems to be a particular favorite of Episcopalians. I don't know that. <laughs> That manifestation that he has power over the elements and that despite it not being his time, he performs miracles. The other manifestations, we'll miss them. But I'm making a challenge to you in our short epiphany season. Instead of spending three or four weeks figuring it out, you have to take the express course. But here's my challenge to you. On the one hand, our challenge is for us to see how God is being made manifest through the work of the body of His church now. How is God being made manifest through His chosen people, the body of Christ? How is God at work through our ministry and our own individual lives? What are the moments that we see God powerfully at work? Serving the poor, reaching out to the sick, consoling the bereaved, and even shielding the joyous. Where is the church at work making manifest the glory of God through her worship, through the sacraments, through the proclamation of His Holy Word? But I'll give you one more challenge. How are you making manifest? God's love and God's glory. Because it's easy to think about it as all of us or all of them. But what about me? What about you? How is your life showing forth, making manifest the glory of God? The 12 step programs talk about, they describe themselves as programs not of promotion, but of attraction. 
And so too the faith must be both of those. We both promote the faith, we propagate the faith, is the right word that we use. And yet at the same time, how in our lives are we becoming more like Christ? How in our lives are we showing forth God's love? So that others are attracted, not to us as individuals, but to Him who is shining through us. To Him who is being made manifest through us. Through Him who is making us holy. We are to be looking in the coming weeks, not only at how God is working through others and through His church, but how we can take opportunities, how we can be manifestations of the love of God. You are God's ambassador. You are Jesus' ambassador to a world that so desperately needs to know Him. So, you get to be the bright light. You get to be the light bulb. Or maybe better yet, a tongue of fire. I know we, we can talk about the Holy Spirit on weekends other than Pentecost, I promise you. So let us be active and busy in our life of prayer, in the life of sacraments, and in the life of service. May we worship and glorify Him. And may we reach out to others to make manifest that love that He has so freely given us. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let us, by grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, be pleasing to God as well, and show forth His glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit,